Well, good morning, church. It's a joy to be with you once again this morning. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Mike. And if you've been journeying with us over the last six to eight weeks, you'll be aware that we're walking through 1 Thessalonians together. And this morning we have our final session in this wonderfully encouraging epistle. If you have your Bibles handy, please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll be reading from verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labour among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We all have many highs in life, don't we? But the highs in life are usually followed by the stark, often, often mundane reality of the everyday. When we're young, school holidays arrive, but within a few weeks, it's back to the books. I have a friend at work who is a kind of glass half empty person. He bemoans holidays because it just means they'll be over soon and he'll be back at work in no time. A wedding day is one of such excitement and happiness, but marriage, we understand, requires faithful, patient, loving and self-sacrificial work from both parties if it is to succeed. Retirement arrives, but without planning or a sense of purpose, it can leave us alone and feeling unnecessary, discouraged and discarded. I remember the excitement of being with many like-minded, enthusiastic and joyful young Christians at Bible College. It was such an encouraging, positive environment. Everyone was keen to learn and serve. I didn't think anything could slow us down. But Bible college is kind of not the real world. The world God has placed us in is complex, broken, and characterized by self-absorbed, spiritually blind, and materialistic individuals. Spiritually speaking, we know the highs and lows that can follow soon after. Perhaps we've been to a camp, to a ministry to get together or a conference and we leave there inspired. The Lord has challenged and asked us to work on something that we're determined to do so. And yet often the week that follows is one of the most challenging in our lives. We've reached such a point in First Thessalonians this morning. If you're a Christian and heard the words, Jesus is coming again with power and majesty, that you'll meet with those who have gone before in the air and together with a new body, We will all behold him in all his glory and might. Friends, if that does not excite, spur you on and cause you to be taken away in your mind's eye as to what it might be like, I don't think anything else will. After the high of considering the imminent imminent return of Jesus, will it be tomorrow? Could it be next year or sometime into the future? Paul says, be encouraged, be prepared with faith, Love and hope being what sustains us while we wait for that great day. After these lofty thoughts, it's time to consider the here and now though. As we wait expectantly, what should our focus, what should our attention be on? As we'll see today, Paul now speaks to the practical outworking of the church community as he points to both our corporate and personal responsibilities. Then he gives us a sense of perspective as we live in the here and now. So I'd like us to briefly look at three things, our corporate responsibilities, our personal responsibilities, and have a snapshot of the tremendously encouraging words that Paul finishes this epistle with. In regard to the corporate responsibility, Paul refers to, he speaks as to how we should respond to spiritual leadership. In verses 12 and 13, we ask you brothers to respect those who labour among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. God, in his infinite wisdom, has a leadership structure with which he desires the church to be governed. 
The fundamental purpose is for the local community of God's people to be led by individuals that are biblically qualified, spirit-filled, and pastorally sensitive, with a character that lends itself to working well within a team environment, all for the common good. Without such leadership, the local church becomes susceptible to all kinds of false teaching, political infighting, and immaturity. Everyone goes their own way. Strong personalities are given free reign to prop- propagate their own wants and desires and the potential for the gospel message to be drowned out and the testimony of our God being undermined becomes a direct possibility, even a probability. Therefore, Paul asks for two responses from the church community toward its leaders, respect and love. Respect because the leaders of the local church labour among you in the Lord and admonish you, esteeming and love because of the very work that they're engaged in. Now, as many of you know, I'm a, a serve as an elder here at Canterbury Gardens, and I kind of thought the best way to deal with these verses so no one would think that I'm seeking my own praise would be to move on quickly. But then I was really challenged with the fact that if Paul can say these words and have a good reason for doing so, it would be reckless of me to simply ignore them. I'm not going to go through the nuts and bolts of pastoral ministry. Most of you know the 24-hour nature of being a pastor, of comforting those who are grieving, giving counsel to the parent of a wayward child, of listening to and praying with those who have been diagnosed with a serious illness, of sharing the heartache of a marriage that is on the brink, of encouraging those who are low, of being available to the church community for issues of depression, financial hardship, relationship struggles, grief or any other number of situations we find ourselves dealing with in this broken world. These things and more result in a great deal of prayer and nights lying awake because they're not always easily answered. Much grace, patience and faith in a sovereign God is required to minister in these circumstances, not to mention the need for an understanding, loving and supportive spouse. Well, all that I've mentioned is common in any local church and the vast majority of pastors have a passion to journey alongside through the highs and lows of life, the people that they're called to serve. They have a clear calling and do their utmost to use their gifts to serve those that they are shepherding. Paul's point here is that in light of their labour, leadership and self-sacrifice, consider how you can show them respect and love. Now, we're not talking about those few who abuse their positions of power. Men and women in positions of authority in churches who are in it for financial gain, who take advantage of the weak or have disqualified themselves due to habitual sin or character flaws that would make them incapable of being true under shepherds. Rather, if they serve, labour, work among us as God has called them, how can we esteem them in love? I'd like to offer just three observations in no particular order. Friends, if you're going to serve, please serve with enthusiasm. The gifts we are given are for the common good of the church, not for our glory, but his. For the building of God's kingdom, to counsel, encourage, serve, teach, to give, guide, to pray for, to protect or comfort the rest of the church family. If the message of the gospel is to be truly effective, it is not simply up to a select few, but for all of us to see that we are only ever truly effective as a community of God's people where everyone works together. So I ask you, are your gifts used or hidden away? How often do you hear of a need and leave it to someone else when maybe you could be the one to put your hand up? Perhaps you have the skill set to help in that regard. So much encouragement is to be given by those who are prepared to do so. One way to show respect and love to those in leadership is to put your own hand up when there's a job to be done, using your gifts where they can build up the church of Jesus Christ. Secondly, friends, be a joy, not a burden to shepherd. The real heartache The real source of sadness and even grieving in ministry is not from what occurs from outside, but from within. The biggest scars leaders, pastors are left with are most often caused by those who are closest to them, from those who belong in their own community. From you and I, 
from those who are overly critical, from those who expect much but do little, who are able to see fault in others all too easily. Friends, on a practical note, before you feel compelled to send that email, to write that text, to pick up the phone, sit on it for 24 hours and ask yourself, is what I want to send simply to make me feel better, to get my point across, so that my sense of justice can be heard, or is this for God's glory? Is this for my sake or the Lord's? Thirdly, friends, and by far most importantly, pray. Pray for your leaders. If you're thankful for the pastoral team, pray for them. If you're unhappy with some aspects of what's going on, pray for them. I have a, a, a book written by a well-known pastor on my shelves and I pulled it down recently and, and read it again. And at the end of the book, he has a question and answer session. And one of the questions that's asked him was, how do you deal with criticisms from within your own flock? And I thought his answer was really instructive. He said, well, I, I, I say to those people, thank you for bringing this to my attention. I will bring this before the Lord. Could I ask you to please those things as you look at me at my ministry that you feel uh, are lacking, please pray. Pray that God will complete in me the work that he's began. I know personally I, uh, I've been praying that God's will becomes the passion of those who are making decisions here at Canterbury Gardens. That his way will be imported into the hearts and minds responsible to the great shepherd for how they lead and care for his church. And it doesn't matter whether it's the elders, the pastors, com. It can be small group leaders, youth and young adults leaders. It could be play group leadership. It could be kids church leadership. Whatever ministry that Canterbury Gardens is involved with, where there is leadership, please be in prayer for those folk. They need God's grace, God's help, and your encouragement in those things. As I mentioned last week, I attended a church that closed its doors due to a split. I just want to say that this split started with the leadership and it spread like gangrene. As a leadership, we need your prayers. I'll be honest with you, if you're looking for a perfect leadership team, uh, you haven't found it at Canterbury Gardens. I should know I sit with these guys and they know my shortcomings because they sit with me. Yet we continue to journey together, sharing with each other the highs and lows of life. There's nothing perf perfect about us, but what is encouraging to me, can I say to you, the church community, what is encouraging to me is that we have a, a leadership team here at Canterbury Gardens who are teachable, humble, who love the Lord from the bottom of their heart and care deeply for the flock that they're responsible for. Well, our corporate responsibility doesn't finish with our response to leadership, but importantly, it extends towards each other. As Paul appeals for peace among them, he starts verse 14 by addressing the church community as brothers, as a community of God's people. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. As I touched on earlier, another way of respecting the pastors is to not sit back and expect them to do all the heavy lifting. Paul Tripp is fond of uh, saying what uh, has become part of my vernacular too. And he says this, our sanctification is a community project. What he means is that becoming more like Jesus, uh, we help each other as part of that process. The truth is that often you see the struggles of your friends before anyone else, before anyone in the pastoral team. You see them because you know them. You meet with them. You talk with them regularly. Why not you be the first one to encourage, to support, to pray with and carry those who are less able? That means, as Paul mentions, we all have a role to play in keeping people on track, in helping them to see the danger of being idle spiritually of not letting people be content with their progress, no matter what their age, but continuing to spur with each other on, to encourage each other in their walk with the Lord. Paul says to encourage the faint-hearted, and this means literally to carry those who are warriors. Do you have friends who are weighed down by the worry of this world? It's such a challenging comment to make in the season that we've just come through. 
How can what you've learned or been encouraged by help these folk? Paul goes on to say, help the weak. To help the weak is to journey alongside those who are morally or spiritually susceptible to sin, to poor judgment, or they're simply immature. With any church community, there are people with different strengths and weaknesses. Those who are strong, mature, or wise, who have seen the wonder, the power, and grace of God transform their own lives and others, have such a key role to play in helping these Christians that just need someone to walk beside them, someone to mentor, someone to journey with them. In regards to those in the flock who require more work, who need to be regularly encouraged, strengthened, supported and guided, please be patient. Don't give up on those ones as God in Christ has not given up on you or I. Finally, as he considers community care, Paul says, don't hold grudges. Don't seek to repay someone what they may deserve. Rather, as a follower of Jesus, who wants to follow in the master's footsteps, seek to do good. These community-focused servants of the Lord have inward habits that enable them to function effectively in this role. No one can function effectively on a corporate level if they are not having things transpire, things change in their own heart as they walk as they journey with the Lord. And so Paul now in verses 16 and 17 points to those personal development responsibilities. He says there, these are folk that rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Now on the face of this, you and I might say, how do we do this? I mean, Paul, it's all well and good to say, do these things, but how? I mean, really, Paul, were you rejoicing when the ship you were in sunk? Were you giving re- thanks while receiving the lashes that you received? Praying while try- trying to dodge and avoid the stones that were being hur- hurled at you by an angry crowd as they sought to stone you? All of these things happened to Paul. But to, but to say these things is simply not to understand what Paul really means with these words. You see, we don't understand joy in suffering disappointment or other trials of life because we equate it with a feeling. Biblical joy reflects an understanding that God holds all things in his hands. It is more concerned with God's glory and the spiritual riches to come than with temporal discomfort. When he speaks about prayer, he's talking about communion with God and it's the secret behind any joyful Christian. Praying constantly doesn't mean we should stop all work and social interaction, go and join a monastery or be constantly on our knees. Though sometimes it's appropriate to be on our knees before the Lord. By way of example, as a Christian, is God through his indwelling spirit not with you always, wherever you are, whatever you're doing? Is that not the case? As a Christian, that is the case. Do you constantly talk with and consider his thoughts on matters as you go throughout your day? If you do, you understand what Paul refers to here. Prayer is more than closing our eyes and bowing our heads, though that is appropriate at some points. Prayer is a constant conscious appreciation of Christ, wherever we may be and whatever we're doing. Giving thanks is the natural or outpouring of a heart that is transformed by the gospel. It is recognising that truly all we have is his. From our salvation in the here and now to the glory that it awaits. It is the true appreciation of the words found in Romans 8.28. We know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. To rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances is to be able to see something of God's perspective and live out what we sometimes glibly recite in church circles, that our God is a sovereign God, that he is in control. One of the joys of pastoral ministry is journeying with people who are going through significant trials, and I cannot count how many times these Christian folk that we've journeyed with have expressed such a joy, such a deep passion and love for Jesus in the in the uh, deep... Uh, soul-crushing trials of life. And it's a joy to see God's people with such faith, with such joy in heartache. 
with such a prayerful life, with such a desire for their testimony to be a powerful one for their Lord. Well, combined with these attitudes of the heart, when it comes to personal development, there is a responsibility to not quench the Holy Spirit, not despise prophecies, but to hold fast to what is good while abstaining from evil. The second crucial personal trait that we can all develop in this area is, is in the area of wise discernment. Here in his final exhortation, put, Paul puts in these short, sharp requests that speak to the ability or otherwise of Christians to exhibit wise discernment. Firstly, he says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, before we quickly delve into how we might quench the Holy Spirit, let me say we do not have final authority over the omnipotent Spirit of God. For reasons that only God fully knows, there are things that we can do that will quench his work in us. It's not that he's subservient to us, because sometimes, perhaps, perhaps often for our sakes, the Holy Spirit overrules in our hearts. But there are things we indulge with that will suppress his work. Some of these things include despising prophecies. Paul says it there in verse 20. In the context of the New Testament, there must have been many people getting up and saying, thus says the Lord. How were these new Christians, these new believers, to, to determine truth from falsehood? By testing. Is what they hear consistent with what those they knew and trusted also taught? Is it supported or contrary to what the Old Testament scriptures speak of? As they prayed and sought God's wisdom, were the spirit confirming with their spirit as to its truth? Were those with the gift of discernment supportive or cautious of these claims? Friends, if you hear a preacher, author or podcast expose something that is not grounded in the revealed word of God, beware. No revelation, teaching, writing, no matter who it is from or who says it, is consistent that is not consistent with the Bible, is from God. Well, we can also quench the Holy Spirit by neglecting the gifts that he's given us. When Paul writes to his disciple Timothy, he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Do not neglect the gift with which you have, which was given to you by prophecy when that council of elders laid their hands on you. And then he goes on in 2 Timothy and says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul's point here is that in neglecting one's gift, it's kind of tantamount to quenching the Spirit's power. So again, there's that recurring theme, friends. Is your gift used? Is it neglected? Or perhaps is it even suppressed? Thirdly, Harboring bitterness towards others is a key way that we quench God's spirit. Paul says in Ephesians 29, 32, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion so that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If there is bitterness towards another, make it right. Now, bow your heads in just a moment of silence. Lay it out before a God who loves you, who will take that burden off you. Grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit are, I think, closely linked. We quench God's Spirit through what we do or don't do. The Spirit being grieved is an outworking of us quenching, quenching God the Spirit. God is so invested in us as Christians. He loves us so deeply. He so passionately wants his best for us that when we resist, walk our own path, quench the work of God's Spirit, it grieves him deeply. Well, thankfully, God's Spirit chooses to overall our, overrule our own quenching tactics and he pulls us back into line more often than we probably ever realise or deserve. But that doesn't change the fact that sometimes days, weeks or tragically even years can go by where we are bitter, ineffective and selfish in our role of building God's kingdom. 
If Paul were to finish there, we might feel the weight of expectation, the burden of walking by God's standards, of asking the question, how? How could these things be true of me? How can I minister to God's community? How can, how can I really rejoice always, pray without ceasing, while being thankful in all circumstances? Not to mention, I shouldn't be quenching the Holy Spirit. I should hold fast to what is good and abstain from evil. We might be so crushed with what is placed on our shoulders, we become, as he mentioned earlier, faint-hearted. But no, as if understanding the heaviness some of us might feel about where we're at, about how far we have to go, or how much we fall short of these instructions. Paul gives us some of the most pastorally tender, inspiring, comforting and insightful words he could have written. Words that convey hope and put the exhortations all of the epistles ask of us into true perspective. Read with me again these wonderful words from verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Friends, God is in the business of sanctification. He will complete what he has started in you. As the words of Philippians 1, 6 says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. You are going to have seasons of plenty and seasons of drought in this life. Times when it all comes together and other times when it seems such a mess. Sometimes if we're honest, we've quenched God's spirit. Yet out of his great love, he does not abandon us. We are a collection of imperfect people put together by a God whose love extended to the cross. Where Jesus Christ took our sin and paid the price that we rightly owed to a holy God. But we were not saved and left like a rudderless ship. Instead, God the Spirit dwells within, that we might know the power of God to overcome by His grace to become the people He desires us to be. Nor are we given a list of rules to follow in order to find ourselves worthy in God's eyes. And sometimes the ex exhortations in the epistles can appear that way. And in, in 1 Thessalonians alone, we're told to abstain from sexual immorality, to be alert, not idle, respect those in positions of authority, be at peace, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks always. If Paul were to end his letter there, perhaps we could be forgiven for thinking behaviour modification is the goal of Paul. But in verse 23, Paul offers up this beautiful prayer on behalf of the church. As if that wasn't enough, he ramps it up even more with what he says in verse 24. For my money, this is so encouraging. It's what sets apart the Christian faith from anything else. You see, both my salvation and sanctification is a work that God brings. He provides and he completes. Our God is faithful. We talked about that last week. The promises of God, we can have sure, confident, complete hope, trust in because he is God and he is promised. He will do what he has promised. What does he say there in verse 24? He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Our God is not looking for perfection, nor behavior adjustment. He looks for a heart transformed. A heart that wants to be transformed, that desires to walk the path that he has set out for us. For he calls you, he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do do it. Amen. God is not expecting Superman or Wonder Woman who will be able to bring all of these attributes we've been talking about into their relationship with him. Rather, he's seeking humble, teachable disciples with a passion for walking his path for us. Everything else God has the power to do. As a follower of Jesus Christ, God has an incredible, unique and blessed future for you and I to enjoy. He will do it because he has promised to complete the good work he's began. If you are listening and you aren't a Christian, perhaps God's spirit is speaking to you this morning. Perhaps he's asking you to open your heart to allow him to restore you to himself.
Now is the time to quietly acknowledge your need. Jesus Christ will in no way turn away anyone who is willing to confess their need in him. Come to him now and you will in no way be turned aside. As a church, a community of God's people who are far from perfect, we will love to have you journey with us as we wait for that great and glorious day when we shall see him face to face. Well, the final exhortations from verse 25 to 28, uh, for the sake of time, we will leave. But I just want you to take note again of the importance that Paul sees in prayer, in praying for each other. Verse 25, brothers pray for us. If there's nothing else we can do, there is power in prayer. So as we conclude, how does God want you to respond to those in positions of responsibility in church life? Maybe you're one of those people who think of the pastors too highly and you need to recognise that they are people just like you. Though more likely in the culture that we live in, you see all their faults and choose to judge them accordingly. How could you and I minister others within the wider church community? Who could you encourage, pray for, admonish in love or walk beside this week? Sometimes the best means of support is simply being a good listener. You don't have to have all the answers. My wife reminded me again this week. She was telling me about some of the, uh, some of what was on her heart about her work, her school, uh, teaching responsibilities. And I have a tendency to seek to provide answers when people have problems. And she reminded me again, sweetheart, she said, I'm not asking you to solve my problems. I just want someone who can listen, who can hear, who can understand. Where do your spiritual gifts fit into the overall effectiveness of ministry here at Canterbury Gardens? Our community needs you. Without you, we cannot be all that God desires us to be, as each part of the body does its work. Are you neglecting to use the gifts God has given you? And do you realise just how significant your service in the kingdom of God really is? The one with the capacity to love much is also the one who is grieved much through another's thoughtlessness. I wonder, have our actions or lack thereof grieved the Holy Spirit? Is there bitterness or anger towards others that is hindering your Christian life? Have you ever considered that ignoring or denying the power of God's word, thinking it has no more to teach or that its message is for others to hear, not so much you, Or that when it becomes an optional extra in your life, have you ever considered that this grieves God's spirit? It has to because it is the primary means through which he speaks to us. It's actually despising God's revelation to you when God's word is not considered uh, important in your life. God is faithful and he will surely do it. He can and will restore, draw to himself, creating you a capacity to be all that he plans you to be. Will you, by faith, accept his offer today? Well, there we have it, church. We're at the end of First Thessalonians. Uh, Chuck Swindle, uh, I was listening to him some time ago, and in passing, he mentioned First Thessalonians, and he made an interesting comment. He said he now recommends to any new Christians that before they read anything else, they read First Thessalonians, because he sees it as a snapshot of the Christian life. It's not complex, it's not difficult, it's not full of doctrinal issues that are hard to understand. Rather, it's perfect for the new Christian. I love that about this book. I trust you can come away with some things that have encouraged, challenged and even strengthened you on your Christian journey. Please keep praying for those you know who have wandered away or have never come near to the Lord. By God's grace and out of his great mercy and love, No one is too far from the miracle of new birth in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord God, for where we've been in 1 Thessalonians, we want to thank you for what you've caused our hearts, our minds to consider. May we hear and obey your word. May we be sensitive to the Spirit's prompting and respond to the claims of Christ. Give us eyes to see those in need and the courage to use the gifts you've given us to build your church. If we're hindering your work, grieving the Holy Spirit in any way, help us to see, acknowledge, and turn to you for restoration. If there are those who don't know you, out of your great
great love and grace, please draw them to yourself. We ask this in and through the power of Jesus' name. Amen.